From my heart and from my hand Why don't people understand my intention? So good morning. Welcome back. Hope you guys had a relaxing holiday period and managed to stay inside your bubbles. Let's see what we can all do to improve 2021. Um, holidays are time for reflection, but they're also a period where things tend to go wrong. And actually, over the last two weeks, we actually had a power cut here in the workshop, which actually killed the trickle chargers that were keeping some of the minis alive. And that set me off thinking about uh, there has to be a better way to monitor battery health and levels uh, without you know cracking open the car, starting the ignition, or just relying completely on a trickle charger. And I came across this. So this is a, a Bluetooth device that attaches to the battery that monitors the levels and actually sends out notifications on the conditions and the levels that your battery charges at. So it's a very simple app to use. So what I'll do is just quickly run through you that. Before we start to talk about uh, the next steps for the EV project with the Clubman, um, because it's now time to start uh, pulling this one apart. But the first consideration is to look at exactly where the battery placements need to be, uh, both from uh, an easy access standpoint, but also in terms of keeping the weight distribution correct across the car. So uh, anyway, let me just quickly show you the, uh, the app that goes with this because I do find this really useful and then we'll crack on and talk about the Clubman. Oh, before I forget, I know that some of you are showing interest in some of the other things that are lying around in my workshop and that there's a handful of cyclists that are also uh, have joined the channel. Uh, so I thought uh, I would share with you one of the classics that I've actually got in the workshop related to bikes. It's not mini related. So for those that are interested, stick around to the end of the video and uh, I'll share with you one of the other British classics. So as you can see, I've got the Bluetooth device connected directly to the battery. Uh, I've also got the trickle charger plugged in in the rear as well. But uh, what I wanted to show you was you know, the information that's readily available to you when you're using the app connected to this. Now, as long as you are within 20 meters of the car, you can get live information on the condition of your battery. In the app itself, you can see here, I've got three cars already wired up using the Bluetooth. There's one for each car. And it's giving me live information on you know the levels of the cars. You can see here the Clubman in the middle is only at 75% at the moment. But if we use the top one to give you some idea of what information is available, it gives you the temperature of the battery, the voltage that's available, and at the bottom, a little bit of history on what's been happening with that temperature and the state of charge and the voltage over time. Uh, what's really nice about it as well is that you can also associate pictures with it. I've just got it on a list view as it stands right now. But uh, again, very useful because you do not need to turn the car on. This is information that if you're within a, you know, a 20 meter distance of the car, you'll be able to see what's going on with the car. Particularly useful around winter time when the cars are not getting used too much or if they're stored like mine in a workshop and you're not around them constantly. So yeah, uh, very useful. So staying on the topic of batteries, but moving over to the Clubman. So battery placement on the Clubman is important because there's a couple of reasons why I chose the Clubman. One of them is actually to do with the cargo space in the back of the car because outside of wanting to maintain a vintage Mini, I also want to use this as an events support vehicle because in the last few years there's been quite a growth in uh, vintage bicycle events where you need a bike that is older than 25 years old so I thought this would be nice to keep in spirit of those events and have something old that can be used to support the riders so the storage in the bike I want to try and maintain as much as possible so that I can use that to put uh, bicycle wheels and obviously as you can see from this one bikes on the roof as well so yeah lots of things to consider in terms of the electric conversion and where the batteries will actually go. 
So one of the nice things about the uh, Clubman, what attracted me to it as an electric project is obviously the additional space. Because you do have a flip up seat in the back here that gives you access to quite some nice space, as you can see. And it's actually the depth of a traditional lead acid battery already. So that's actually quite a useful space, uh, particularly if we want to do a range extender battery, which I do want to do in this particular case. So on top of the uh, possible storage on the, the folding back seat, we've obviously got the cargo area as well. Now, again, I want to try and maintain as much depth as possible because the idea is actually to store wheels and the back of the cargo area. So we've got a couple of choices. We can either run kind of like a false floor on top of the deck area, uh, which would lose uh, some of the depth of the boot itself. Um, probably still enough for wheels because the wheels can obviously be laid down, but um, I'd rather maintain as much depth, depth as I possibly can. The other option is a little bit more intrusive because if you see here in the floor, there is already a square cut out in the floor for the spare wheel well and also where the uh, exhaust fits underneath and the fuel tank. So one of the other thinkings as well is that I basically cut out this particular square and have an aluminium box made to drop down the weight uh, of the batteries in line with the axles. Um, it doesn't carve up the car too much. Uh, and could potentially be, you know, replaced or repaired to return it back to normal. Uh, but honestly, I don't have any intention of selling this car anyway. So at this point in time, it's more about the practical use of the car uh, itself. We may also well have to run a couple of support struts if we cut out the floor across from either the shock mounts or from just below the window, just to add some additional strength. So if I just show you this from underneath, let's just close those for a minute. You can probably see what I'm talking about. So there's the spare tire well and the exhaust, which should allow us to build a box that drops down to the same level as, or the same depth as the subframe. And hopefully we can get some batteries hidden in the floor in the rear of the car just simply by cutting out that square that's in the back. So I'm very keen to get the weight distribution correct and by use, utilizing that square I should be able to get the weight of the batteries right over the center of the uh, the hub running across and as you can see on the old petrol engine there's a 10 or 12 litre tank that is at right at the tail end of the car. So actually moving the weight of that forward with the batteries should help the handling characteristics not change too much. And actually might even be an improvement when you take out the exhaust weight and the fuel tank as well. So yeah, we need to get a aluminium drop down box created to go in between the uh, the subframe rails and uh, hopefully that'll be enough for the batteries. Now you can see that I've removed the fuel tank and the exhaust. You can see how much space we've actually got to play with and it's quite quite some space back here. One thing I did notice is that the subframe on this one has gone in the corners so it's going to need complete replacement obviously because if you're supporting the weight of batteries you need to be uh, careful so let's see now you look at the actual depth you can play with for this conversion from the bottom of the floor it's actually uh, quite good around about uh, 20 centimeters so there we go. Uh, clearly the battery placement and the battery box need to be constructed and installed before the car actually goes to the body shop to have the rust repair and the paint refresh done as well. And I'm also keeping in mind that uh, in terms of timeframes, what I learned from the Grey Mini 
is that the deadlines these days, they're almost irrelevant. I mean, the job will get done as it's practically needed. And obviously with this being an EV conversion, this is a first for me as well. So I'm not gonna put myself under the additional pressure of having hard deadlines for this stuff uh, moving forward. And again, all of the work that we do on this, we will take into account the feedback that you gave uh, at the end of last year regarding making this as sympathetic as possible to the original car while making it fit for use. And this, in this particular case, it would be as a, an events vehicle. So yeah, that's it for this update. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video and for the cyclists, uh, stick around uh, for the end of this video because there's another British classic. So switching from one British engineering marvel to another, I thought I'd share this with you because I know some of you are actually cyclists that watch the channel yourselves and uh, got something rather special here because this, believe it or not, is now 20 years old, so almost considered a classic. And it's from a company called Pace. And it's an RC200 F7 frame that was being raced by the teams at the time. Unique in the sense that uh, they came up with a square aluminium fluted tubing frame that also incorporated what we now take for granted, which is disc brakes on a cycle. And it's pretty unique. It was never repeated uh, as an overall product. Pace as a company still exists, but they've switched to the pretty much global standard now as far as frame design is concerned. So it's rather special. Uh, the disc brakes themselves are also from a UK company called Hope that again pioneered the idea of hydraulic disc brakes on the mainstream. So the bike itself is still in original condition that you would have found back then, including one of the very first SRAM ESP systems and the Synchro straight post seat post. Uh, unfortunately, I changed the forks a number of years ago because it did originally have the uh, carbon paste forks on there, but I replaced them with the RockShox silo for no other reason other than the fact that I was actually working for RockShox at the time. So it's not very PC to have a competitor's product on your bike. So yeah, it doesn't get much use these days. Um, as you can probably see, it's uh, gathering dust, but still something special in my collection of classics okay guys hope you enjoyed the update and take care and talk to you soon bye bye